Good morning, friends. Let me remind you that we've got Bible school coming up this week, Monday through Friday, 5.30 to 8 o'clock. Uh, if you've got any multivitamins or Wheaties or whatever, you better be eating them because it, it, it is a marathon. Also, thank you to all the guys who came out in the hot weather yesterday and worked and got the church property whipped into shape. It looks great. Thank you very much. Vincent, will you read a call to worship, sir? <clears throat> Uh, good morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 13. The heading on this is called, How Long, O Lord? When I was reading this, I was like, it's, it reminded me of me on a daily basis, you know? As I complain, I complain, I complain, I pray, then I rejoice and with praise to God. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say, say I have prevailed over him lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this day, Lord. Thank you for all the beautiful faces that are here this morning. Lord, thank you for allowing us to... Um, just freely uh, worship you, um, Lord, and, and Lord, I just pray that you would be with uh, the band this morning, and I pray that uh, you would be with Brent as he preaches. I pray that you would uh, fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you would uh, give him all the words that, uh, that we need to hear this morning, Lord, and I just pray that uh, you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that you would give us... Uh, uh, the attention that we need, that you would soften our hearts and you would open our ears. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
morning. So before I read, I was looking through some different things this morning. I came across this quote for fathers. It's from Charles Spurgeon. It says, if you are truly fathers, you cannot help loving all the family. The fatherly instinct is love, and fathers in Christ should be brimful of it. Little ones should be induced by our loving spirit to come around us, feeling that if nobody else loves them, we do. If nobody else cares for them, we do. I thought that was good. All right, Brent asked me to read Acts 13, 13 to 16, and then we'll skip down to verse 38. So verse 13, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. We'll skip down to 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is free from everything, from which you cannot be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even, even if one tells you it, tells it to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day that you've given us. We thank you that you've uh, given this facility to us to meet, Lord. Um, we're thankful for all those who, who show up here on Sundays, Lord, all those who have a desire to, to want to know more about you. Lord, I pray that you would be to them what they need this morning, Lord, that your spirit would move, that you would convict hearts, and that you would save souls today, if it be your will, Father. We do thank you for all these men who faithfully bring their children week in and week out, Lord. Um, I pray that you would help them to be the fathers and the example they need to be to their household. And just strengthen and encourage them, Lord. We're thankful that we serve a risen Savior, a Savior that is capable of forgiving all our sins, Lord. We pray this morning that, that our worship would be pleasing to you, our songs, um, the reading of scripture, the teaching, Lord. I pray that it would all be pleasing and that it would glorify your name. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to try a new song this morning. We've never done this one before. Let's stand and sing. <clears throat> Please. 
that song. That's a good one. Uh, this last song has the most to do with the sermon this morning. God moves in a mysterious way. We're going to see in our sermon this morning that that is indeed true.
let's pray. Father, thank you that we have a church to come to uh, where we can hear the scriptures, uh, not the traditions of men, not platitudes, not self-help advice, but the word of God. Thank you so much for that. And thank you that there's nobody here that we have to please this morning but you. And we ask that you will be pleased <clears throat> with the attention that we give to the scriptures. I ask that you be pleased with my preaching and our hearing of the word of God. We ask, Lord, that you give us a spirit of wisdom, insight, discernment. Help us to see how these things that we're going to read this morning apply to our lives personally. Uh, help it not just to be head knowledge. We pray these things would make a practical difference in the way that we talk, act, and make decisions in the coming weeks and days ahead. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus died for sinners. And because he died for sinners, we can look to him in faith and ask you this morning to forgive us of all of our sins. We confess... Uh, that we miss the mark daily in thought, in word, in deed, in desire, in motive, and that we are profoundly broken this side of glory. Uh, thank you that Jesus was broken for us, that we might be reconciled to a holy God. Uh, thank you that he rose from the dead and that he is our justification. He is our righteousness. As that song said, we're, uh, we're clothed in white, and God is pleased to look on Christ when he looks at me. Uh, thank you for the gospel. Uh, we pray that it will be clear this morning. We pray also, uh, Father, that you would reveal more and more of your character and your ways to us as we look at this text. Uh, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will govern and constrain our time together in the Word now and that you will continue to grow your church and grow your kingdom and continue to fit us for your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning we're going to start a... A uh, brief sermon series in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, this is a, a book of the Bible that was written 26 centuries ago. 2,600 years ago, the prophet Habakkuk, Habakkuk wrote and ministered. Uh, but in spite of the age or antiquity of this book, it is surprisingly relevant to the problems that we face here in the 21st century. It answers tough questions like the problem of evil. In other words, if God is so good and just then why do evil people seem to get ahead and dominate in this world? It answers questions like the problem of history. Is human history a willy-nilly mishmash of events with no rhyme or reason? Or is history actually going somewhere? Does it have a telos, a goal, a purpose? The book of Habakkuk answers problems like the problem of unanswered prayer. Uh, if God is gracious and merciful and he hears his people, why so often does it seem like when we call out to him that he's not acting and he's not doing anything? So the book of Habakkuk, even though it's 26 centuries old, is very relevant in the topics it deals with. So before we get into the book itself, <clears throat> let's do a brief two-minute Old Testament history refresher because if you're like me, you can forget the sequence of events and things that happen in the Old Testament. So if you will remember, Moses and Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land. This happened around 1400 B.C., 1400 B.C. And things went pretty well for about 150 years. And then we got the period of the Judges, which was complete chaos. Think of people like Gideon, Samson, etc., that period of the judges last, lasted roughly 350 years. And then at the end of the period of the judges, the people said, we want a king. And they got who? They got Saul. He wasn't much of a king. But he was succeeded by David, who was an excellent king. And his son Solomon, who also did a pretty good job up until the last quarter of his life. And during the time of David and Solomon, the nation of Israel uh, reached the zenith of its political power and influence in the world. They were top dog on the world stage during the time of David and King Solomon. And this was between 1,000 and 900 B.C. Now, after Solomon passed away, he uh, left the kingdom to his son Rehoboam, if I'm remembering it right. And Rehoboam split the kingdom. Do you remember there was basically a civil war? And so from that point on, uh, the nation of Israel became two separate entities. The northern kingdom, capital city Samaria, comprised of ten tribes. The southern kingdom, capital city Jerusalem, comprised of two tribes. And after the split of the nation, uh, the people of God were in steady decline for a period of about 300 years. In 722 B.C., the northern kingdom, capital city Samaria, was conquered by the Assyrian army and carried off into captivity. 135 years after that, 
In 586 B.C., the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, Judah, would be conquered by Babylon and carried off into captivity. So, 722, northern kingdom falls to Assyria. 586, southern kingdom falls to Babylon. Habakkuk wrote about 600 B.C., okay? So, he wrote during a time when the nation of Israel was in the process of losing the promised land altogether. He wrote during the final decades of the southern kingdom. He wrote about 15 years before Babylon would come in and level the city of Jerusalem and carry the Jews off into captivity. Uh, what about the author, Habakkuk? What do we know about Habakkuk? Nothing. We know nothing about him personally. He is not mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament or in the Bible, period. And uh, extra-biblical sources don't say anything about Habakkuk. He was just a voice speaking for God in his day and time. Now, the book of Habakkuk is very unique among the prophets. If you've read any of the, of the prophets, especially the minor prophets, what do they do? They get out on the street and they yell at everybody. <laughs> and they say, you're awful and God's going to judge you and you better stop doing what you're doing. Well, Habakkuk does not do that. He simply has a dialogue with God for three chapters. And he speaks on behalf of the faithful remnant of his people in Israel. So let's read Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It says, the oracle, uh, some of your translations may say the burden, the oracle or burden that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you, violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrounds the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So Habakkuk has a complaint. He has a bone to pick with God. He wants to talk with God about an important matter. And he voices this complaint by means of two questions. Why and how long? Uh, but by the way, some of you are note takers. If you're looking for some kind of discernible structure in this sermon, there is none. So just give up right now. Uh, the Old Testament prophets are, are a different animal. A New Testament epistle is a logical argumentation toward a goal. This is a guy talking to God, okay? So there's not a whole lot of structure to this sermon. But Habakkuk's complaint uh, is basically two parts. First, why? Habakkuk complains about the problem of evil. Look at verse 3 and 4. He complains about the problem of evil. Verse 3, why? Why, God, do you make me see iniquity? And why? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. Wicked people surround righteous people and oppress and hold them down. Why, God? Why? So the problem in Habakkuk's day was that Jewish culture and society had degraded and deteriorated to a point of almost absolute moral corruption. God's law was being ignored. Violence and strife characterized Jewish culture and society. It was brother against brother violence. And nobody could get justice on account of the corrupt leaders of Israel. The, the, the kings were corrupt. The judges were corrupt. The government officials were corrupt. Look at verse 4, last half of the verse. <coughs> the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. In other words, wicked Jews outnumbered godly Jews, and the worst thing that one of these godly Jews could do in order to get help was go to the court system because it was guaranteed that the judge would be taking a bribe and he would rule against the godly. That's what had happened in the nation of Israel. It sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The law is ignored. Violence and strife everywhere. Corrupt leaders who will do nothing about it. It sounds like USA 2024, right? In our day, uh, criminals walk into a store in broad daylight, take whatever they want off the shelves. Is, is it echoing in here or is this just me? Okay. Okay, echoing. Um, in our day, do you want me to cut off the headset and just do the pulpit? It has kind of a godly authoritative ring, though, to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. In our day, sounds much less authoritative, but in our day, 
Uh, criminals walk into the store in broad daylight, and if anybody tries to stop them, the person that tries to stop them will be the one who gets lawed. Uh, we have laws in our country that protect those who fund the slaughter of the innocent and perform abortions in abortion mills and clinics throughout the country. And if you are a person who tries to stand up for the unborn, you will get lawed. You, you might get taken to jail and arrested. In our nation, our leaders protect homosexuals and every kind of pervert and sexual deviant from being spoken ill of. And if you speak ill of them, it's a hate crime and you're going to get it. Our politicians consistently sell us out to foreign interests in order to pad their own pockets. In plain violation of the law, our government opens the borders of our nation to a flood of people who are overwhelming our health care system and our social services system and are reaping all the benefits of things they never paid any taxes for. This is plain violation of the law of the land. Our government taxes us, and they take some of that money to fund surgeries to mutilate the genitals of small children and minors who are suffering from mental illness. And worst of all, the church in America today, broadly speaking, is impotent, compromised, and complicit in all of this. So we are living in a day that is in many ways like the day the prophet Habakkuk lived in. America has been in steep decline for a long time, and evil is rampant in our nation. In Habakkuk's day, Judah had been in steep decline for a long time. Evil was rampant in his nation. He cried out in verse 3, <clears throat> verse 3, Why? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? Habakkuk complains because what he knows about God, his theology is not matching up with what he sees in the world around him. In other words, God, if you're so holy and good, then why have you let things in Israel get so bad? Why don't you do something? Why don't you act, God? If you're all powerful and all good, then why are the bad guys always getting ahead? If you're a God of justice, then why is there so much injustice? Why, God, why? We ourselves ask why when we look around at our nation, our culture, our society. But we also ask why on a personal level, do we not? We say things like this, God... If you are so merciful, then why am I suffering so much? God, if you're so good, then why does my job stink so bad? God, if you're such a gracious king, then why do I have cancer? Uh, why did my spouse divorce me? Why can I barely make ends meet? Why are my kids so difficult? God, if you're so strong and good, why are things so bad? This is what theologians refer to as the problem of evil. The problem of evil. If God is all good and all powerful, then why is there evil? Why do bad things happen? It must mean that God doesn't have the power to stop it. Or it must mean that God's really not all good. And this is the theological conundrum called the problem of evil. And oftentimes, atheists and unbelievers will toss out the problem of evil as an argument against the existence of God. But the fact that there is so much evil in the world is actually evidence of the goodness of God. You see, God is perfectly righteous, and he is perfectly powerful. And he could get rid of all evil in the world right now. All he would have to do is vaporize everybody in this room and on this planet, and the problem of evil is fixed. Voila! But because God is good, he is also patient. And he is patient with evil men. He is patient with you and I, church. He does not bring men to judgment the first time they do something evil. God patiently waits until man's iniquity and sin is ripe, and then he acts. <clears throat> so there's evil in the world, not because God doesn't have the power to stop it, not because God is evil or not all good, but because God is good and he's patient with evil men. Brothers and sisters, are you not glad that God does not hastily call us to account for our own evil deeds? If he did, you and I would never have had the opportunity to repent and trust in Christ. First time we sinned, he just struck us dead. Problem of evil solved. I'm glad that God is patient with evil me, and I'm glad that he was patient with me and my evil. You see, God is a God who makes the sun to shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous. And he gives food to the righteous and the unrighteous. 
With regard to the problem of evil, uh, those who are atheists actually have a harder time explaining the problem of evil than Christian people do. Because if you're an atheist, what evil are you talking about? There is no evil. We're just a bunch of molecules bouncing around. The molecules just happen to bounce in a direction you don't like. But, but it's not evil. Evil assumes that there's a transcendent good, a transcendent standard. So actually people who don't believe in God have a harder job explaining evil than people who believe in the God of the Bible. <clears throat> in verse 2, Habakkuk complained about the violence that wicked Jews were inflicting on their own countrymen, their own brothers. Look at verse 2. I cry to you violence, and you will not save. So, so there was brother-on-brother brother violence in the land of Israel. And this brother-on-brother brother violence would reach its culmination and its apex 600 years later as the Jewish people delivered their own brother, their own Messiah, Jesus Christ, to Pontius Pilate for execution. Acts 13, 27, and 28 talks about this. <clears throat> Paul says, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him, him being Jesus. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. This was the ultimate brother on brother violence and injustice. How could God allow the Jews of Habakkuk's day to do violence to one another? How could he allow the Jews to do violence to their own Messiah in Jesus' day? Well, God allows evil to accomplish a greater good. God allows evil in order to accomplish a greater good. God accomplished the repentance and preservation of the remnant in Habakkuk's day. And he accomplished the salvation and forgiveness of sins for all who would believe in Christ through the violence that was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ by his own brothers, his own fellow Jews. God's ways are higher than our ways. So Habakkuk complains about the problem of evil, number one. Number two, he complains about the problem of unanswered prayer. The problem of unanswered prayer. Look at verse two. <clears throat> o Lord, how long, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? So implicit in this complaint is the fact that Habakkuk has been praying about the situation in his nation for a long, long time. This is not his first prayer. He's come to God in prayer many times and said, Lord, look at all this wicked stuff that's going on all around. Are you going to do something about it? He's came over and over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, probably even decade after decade. He says, how long am I going to cry out to you, God, and you do nothing? Now, Habakkuk was a godly man. And he was a true believer. And he's asking, what he's praying for, he's asking according to the revealed will of God. And yet the heavens still seem like brass. And God is not answering. How could God refuse to provide deliverance in such desperate circumstances when this godly man is asking according to the revealed will of God? How long, O oh Lord? God's people have often cried out, how long? And faithful saints have often come to God with the complaint, I've asked and asked and asked God, and I'm asking according to what I see in your word, and you still have not answered. This is a regular experience of God's people down through the ages. Uh, think of Job. Job in his suffering cried out, how long? How long is this going to last? Uh, think about Joseph languishing in an Egyptian prison for a crime that he did not commit month after month, year after year. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Think about the whole nation of Israel. How long were they in slavery to Pharaoh? <clears throat> 400 years. You think anybody came to God and said, how long over the course of 400 years of slavery? The psalm that Vincent read, Psalm 13, 1 through 3, the psalmist says this. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long? Will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. In other words, if you make me wait any longer to answer my prayers, I'm just going to die. This is a common experience of the people 
of God. True saints often languish. True saints often feel as though God has turned a deaf ear to their petitions. Imagine that you're on a country back road somewhere. One of these roads where only 10 or 12 cars pass a day. For, for those of you who are Jackson County residents, imagine that you're on Highway 281, Charlie's Creek, maybe about 10 vehicles a day, and, and you're driving, and you come around a curve, and you see that there's been a head-on head collision there. And, and there's people lying in the road, and they're bloody and crawling around on their hands and knees. And then you look over to the shoulder, and there's a guy standing there like this. And he has not called the ambulance. And he is not lifting a hand to do anything for the people in this head-on collision. Well, this is how Habakkuk feels about God. He's like, my nation has been in a head-on collision. There's violence and strife and injustice everywhere. And God, you're just standing there like this. And I've asked, and I've asked, and I've asked, and still you have not answered. Verse 2 to 3, Habakkuk says, You will not hear, you will not save. You idly look at wrong. Have you ever been puzzled by the silence of God? Some of us have prayed according to the revealed will of God concerning certain situations in our lives for decades and decades with no answer. Godly people have prayed for revival and the restoration of the church in America for decades. And it just keeps going down, down, down. Some of us have prayed for relief from a difficult or painful relationship for decades. And we can see no discernible change. We can't see God answering in any way. Some of us have prayed for a wayward child for decades and decades and decades. And we can't see God acting at all. We all have circumstances and situations in our lives that we have asked for God's help with thousands of times, and yet God remains strangely silent. The cry of our heart is this, How long, O oh Lord? What are we tempted to believe when we pray according to the revealed will of God over and over and over again for up to decades of time? What are we tempted to believe? God must not love me. I must not belong to him. I must not actually be saved. Uh, maybe God doesn't care about my suffering and grief and pain. Well, let me ask you this. Was Habakkuk a true believer? I should hope so. I don't think any uh, unbelievers wrote any books of the Bible. Was Habakkuk a true believer? Yes, he was. Did God care about Habakkuk and his suffering? He most certainly did. Church, don't let unanswered prayer drive you to the point where, where you begin to believe lies about yourself and lies about God. Saints throughout the ages have experienced prolonged periods of time when the heavens seem like brass. This, this is a normal occurrence in the life of God's people. Well, what should we do when we've asked for God to intervene over and over and over again in difficult circumstances and yet he remains silent? We should do what Habakkuk did. We should bring our complaint to the Lord. If you bring your complaint to God in faith, that's a fully acceptable thing. That's what Habakkuk did. Scripture teaches that God sympathizes with our pain and frustration over unanswered prayers. Why does God sympathize with our pain and our frustration over unanswered prayers? Because he has felt that same pain and that same frustration himself. Uh, in Scripture, God cries out how long? Often. Often. When Israel wandered in the desert, uh, God provided them manna. And on the day before the Sabbath, he provided a double portion of manna so that the people would not get out and work on the Sabbath. But they got out and gathered manna on the Sabbath anyway. And Exodus 16, 28 says this. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, How long, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? A little later in Israel's history, Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land to scout it out. Ten of the spies came back and said, These people are like giants. We cannot conquer them. Two of the spies said, We can do it. We can do it. But the people listened to the discouraging report of the ten spies. And they would not go into the promised land. And in Numbers 14, 11, we read this. And the Lord said to Moses, this is God speaking, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? Even Jesus himself cried out how long as he surveyed the unbelief of people all around him, in particularly the unbelief of his own disciples. Listen to Matthew 17, 14 through 17. It says, And when they came to the crowd, that will be Jesus and his disciples, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, 
Have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long? How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. So scripture teaches that God sympathizes with our pain, sympathizes with our pain and frustration over delayed answers to prayer and rampant evil. We should bring all of our complaints, all of our frustrations, all of our heartaches and grief over unanswered prayer to the God who knows himself what it's like to cry out how long. He sympathizes. He gets it. He's been there, done that. So, first four verses, Habakkuk's complaint. Why and how long? Uh, verses 5 through 11, we get God's response to Habakkuk's complaint. Like I said, th this, this whole book of Habakkuk is just a back and forth conversation between the prophet and God. Let's read verses 5 through 11 for God's response. <coughs> God's speaking. He says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. This is just a biblical word for what we know in English as Babylon. Okay, I'm raising up Babylon, the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. In other words, these people are a law to themselves. They have no morals except the code that they dream up for their own selves. Verse 8, their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle's, they fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. In other words, you're not going to stop them. They're like an overwhelming tsunami. Their faces are forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Uh, piling up earth is a reference to building a siege mound. Uh, when you go to overtake a fortified city with a high, high wall, you have to pile up dirt so that you can climb up on the dirt and go over the wall. They pile up dirt and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose might is their God. So Habakkuk has complained about the moral disintegration of his own nation. The violence, the injustice, the strife, the contention. And God agrees with Habakkuk's assessment of the situation. God does not argue. He says, you're right, Habakkuk. I see all of that. And God informs Habakkuk that he is going to do something. He is going to answer Habakkuk's prayer. God says, Habakkuk, I know that the situation is bad, but it's about to get a whole lot worse, much, much worse. I'm going to raise up Babylon, the Chaldeans, to march down to Judah and destroy your entire nation. Well, no doubt Habakkuk had something else in mind in terms of an answer to this prayer. He probably wanted the Lord to intervene and bring a revival and give him a, a godly king and godly judges and then it would be like the glory days again. That's probably what Habakkuk had in mind. But instead, when God answered, he said, I am sending ruthless, vicious, pagan people to destroy your entire nation. God's ways are often very mysterious, are they not? God's ways are mysterious. He often answers our prayers in very unexpected ways. He often uses very unusual instruments and very unusual means to accomplish his purposes. John Newton was a former slave trader who became a pastor. Uh, he wrote the hymn that we all love, Amazing Grace. There was a time in Newton's life when he came to God and he prayed that God would give him a deeper knowledge of God and a more intimate walk with God. And John Newton expected a wonderful vision and experience of God, but instead God answered John Newton's prayer by withdrawing from John Newton. 
And for months, God seemed to have abandoned John Newton to Satan. So, so Newton comes to God and says, I want to know you better. I want to walk closer to you. I want to have a more intimate experience of you, God. And God draws back completely. And he hands Newton over to Satan. And Newton was tempted and tried beyond his comprehension. And God let John Newton go down into the depths so that John Newton might learn to rely and depend entirely on Christ. And when John Newton had learned that lesson, God brought him back up out of the depths again. Uh, listen to this poem that John Newton wrote about the mysterious way that God answered Newton's prayer. He said, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. "'Twas he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair." This was not the answer that Newton was looking for. "'I hope that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. This, this is an unexpected answer to John Newton's prayer for greater intimacy with God. Yea, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this, I trembling cried? Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? "'Tis in this way the Lord rep replied, "'I answer prayer for grace and faith. "'These inward trials I employ from self and pride "'to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy, "'that thou mayst find thy all in me.'" God answered John Newton's prayer in a mysterious and an unexpected way. He answered Habakkuk's prayer in a mysterious and an unexpected way by raising up a ruthless nation to chastise Habakkuk's countrymen. And probably Habakkuk would suffer a lot of this too for their sin and rebellion. Uh, we sang these verses a little bit earlier. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. He rides upon the storm. Deep in the depths of God's own mind, his glory to fulfill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. God moves in mysterious, mysterious ways. Let me ask you this. Have you ever cried out to God for help and been answered in a way that you did not expect in the least? You had in mind exactly what God ought to do to fix this situation that you've been bringing to him over and over and over again in prayer and God did, did something totally unexpected from out of left field that you could have never dreamed up in a million years. How many of you have had that experience? <coughs> Why does God do things like this? Well, one reason is because God is infinitely wise. And therefore, he is privy to several trillion variables that you and I don't know anything about. God is the great I am. You and I are dust. His wisdom is infinite. Ours most certainly is not. And therefore his seemingly mysterious answers to our prayers are oftentimes not going to make sense to our finite minds. Habakkuk cried out, God, don't you see what's going on down here? And God said, yes, I do. I see it better than you do. And therefore I'm going to do something that you would never expect me to do. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, he says, if God were unkind enough to answer some of our prayers at once and in our way, we should be very impoverished Christians. Amen. Look again at verse 5. God speaking. He says, uh, th this is all written in the second person plural. So he's talking to the whole nation. When he says, uh, look among the nations and see, that's plural. He's not just talking to Habakkuk. He's talking to the nation through Habakkuk. So he's, he's talking to all the Jews through Habakkuk. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. So God calls Habakkuk and the entire nation to take note of the awesome work that God is about to do. Uh, maybe you have had the experience of watching on a mid-August afternoon, about 95 degrees outside, 100% humidity, humidity, the air is thick and muggy, and maybe you've watched these thunderheads build on the horizon, and the clouds just keep getting thicker and thicker and puffier and puffier and rising higher and higher, and then you see it start moving your way, 
and the sky begins to darken and you see flashes of lightning and the storm comes over the mountain and over the ridge and then it comes to you and there's hail falling. And like I say, there, there's lightning flashing everywhere, everywhere. The wind's blowing about 50 miles an hour and it's tearing leaves off the trees. And then it passes by and there's all kinds of litter in the, in the yard and things that have blown down and the power's out. God says to his people there in verse 5, Look, see, wonder, be astounded. In other words, watch the storm that is brewing on the horizon. This storm of the Babylonian empire that's going to rise up and sweep through your nation and lay you low. Wonder at the force that it's going to uh, at the force with which it's going to break on the nation of Israel. Stand in awe of the awesome power and purpose of God Almighty. Well, what makes God's raising up of the Babylonian Empire so incredible? At the time God showed Habakkuk what he was about to do, Assyria was top dog in the world. And the empire of Babylon was basically unheard of. But in 20 short years, that would be a complete flip. In 20 short years, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, who nobody knew about or had heard of, would be the most powerful and dominant force on the world stage. God would raise them up quickly. God's people should also be astounded by the intensity of the judgment that is about to come. Did you notice how God described the Babylonians? He said they're dreaded and fearsome. Their horses are swifter than leopards. They sweep by like the wind and go on. But the most incredible thing about God raising up Babylon is the fact that God's own people would be cast off. An awesome and stunning judgment was coming, not on the pagan nations, but on God's own people. God promised Habakkuk that he would judge his own people with the severity and brutality of a powerful pagan nation who had no God but themselves and no morals but their own. That is a fearsome prospect. And this reminds us that God's justice is marvelously impartial. I'm going to say this again. God's justice is marvel marvelously impartial. He will in no wise clear the guilty, no matter who they may be. That includes me. That includes you. Robertson Palmer says this. He's referring to this impartiality of God's judgment. He says, this message is sorely needed in the world today. How many different people of the earth somehow regard themselves as the favorite of the Lord, exempt from the extremities of his judgment that shall be brought on the others? The long-suffering of God, far from leading to repentance, leads them to presumption. Unrepentant sinners beware. So, friends, God is an impartial judge. Be careful that you don't presume on grace like the Jews in Habakkuk's day did. They were all sitting there saying to themselves, you know, the northern kingdom got wiped out about 100 years ago. We're good down here because we've got the capital city, Jerusalem, and God has promised that there will always be a king in the line of David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, so we're basically bulletproof. God judges impartially. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament quoted Habakkuk 1.5 to the Jews in Antioch in order to warn them about rejecting the gospel and assuming that they could do so without judgment overtaking them. Listen to Acts 13, 38 through 41. <coughs> Paul preaching to Jews in Antioch. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, this man being Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And here he quotes Habakkuk 1.5. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. So Paul warned these Jews in the New Testament that if they hardened themselves against Jesus and if they hardened themselves against the gospel message, they could not just sit back and say, we're Jews, we're God's chosen people. Judgment will never overtake us. Paul said, no, sir, God is an impartial judge. Don't presume upon his grace. This is, this is human nature, is it not? We do this all the time. Uh, we ourselves are guilty of some sin. We look over and see that sin in somebody else and say, God's going to get them for that. But I'm fine. He, he won't get me. I'm special to him. Look at verse 5 again. Look among the nations and see... Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work, when? In your days, in your days that you would not believe, 
if told. In other words, Habakkuk, within your own lifetime, all these things are going to take place. I'm going to raise up the nation of Babylon, who's unheard of, to be the top world superpower, and I'm going to wipe out the southern kingdom and level Jerusalem, and this is going to happen within your lifetime, Habakkuk, in your days. You see, God patiently gives people time to repent, but when the time for judgment is ripe, God is not slow to act. These things would happen in Habakkuk's own lifetime. Think about Noah in Genesis 6, verse 11 through 13. It says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God made up his mind on account of the wickedness that he saw in Noah's day to judge the world, to bring a flood that would wipe out the entire human race except for Noah's family. And he told Noah to build an ark. And then Noah built on an ark for a hundred years before the flood came. Now a hundred years prior, God had already decided what he was going to do. And all those people just partied it up for about a century while Noah was building his ark. But when it came time for judgment, it came like a flood. It came quick when the time was ripe. Listen to Matthew 24, verse 36 through 42. This is Jesus speaking. He's speaking about the time of his return. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but, only, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, it's going to be no judgment. We're, we're God's special people. It's okay. Until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. So Habakkuk's contemporaries were presuming upon the grace of God. But judgment was just around the corner. This is going to happen in your days, in your lifetime, Habakkuk. Let me ask this question. Where are you? Where am I presuming on God's grace today? Where are you? Where am I living in sinful ways and expecting that you are a special case that God will not deal with? Do you view God's patience as an opportunity to repent or as a license to sin? Remember that God is an impartial judge. And when God's patience is up, judgment comes very, very swiftly. Well, the prophet Habakkuk complained about the fact that evil was rampant among his people. He complained that God had not answered his prayer. Uh, God did answer, and he said, I'm going to answer in a way that you would never believe. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians, and I'm going to deal with the wickedness of your people by destroying the entire nation. Uh, may the Lord help us to profit from what we've heard this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we confess that your ways are higher than our ways and that your wisdom is higher than our wisdom and that the things that you choose to do are not the things that we would choose to do most of the time because you are so much better than we are, so much wiser than we are, so much more excellent than we are. Uh, you are the great I am and we are but dust. We pray that you'd help us to trust you even when your ways seem mysterious to us. We pray that we would not grow weary regarding things that we brought to you in prayer for decades, but that, that we continue to ask and seek and knock and know that you sympathize and you will answer us when the time is right and you will do what is good. We pray, Father, uh, for our own country and the rampant evil that we see all around us. We ask, Lord, that you would act. We're, we're thankful that you see these things more clearly than we do and that you have a solution that is better than anything we could dream up, and it will be in our best interest. Help us to trust you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So you go to the Lord in prayer and prepare your heart to take communion.
believers in Jesus Christ. It is not for unbelievers. It is a holy meal. It is not a common meal. It is for those who have rested all their hope on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is for those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord. If you're not yet a baptized believer, you should refrain from partaking until you have repented, believed, and been baptized, and then you may partake. Also, the Lord's table is for saved sinners. All Christians are saved sinners. But if you have made peace with some kind of sin in your heart and in your life, we ask that you would do business with God before you partake. When you're ready, you may come. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, we read these words. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing God Moves in a Mysterious Way. <clears throat>
God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. You're at liberty to go. Yeah.